In order to do that, we're going to travel to Jurassic Park. Now, many of you may be familiar with this movie from the 1990s. It was groundbreaking in more ways than one. So some of you may know it through the visual effects. This was the first main portrayal of dinosaurs on the big screen. But we're going to look at the cybersecurity aspect of it. And you may not have realized when you watched the movie, but Jurassic Park actually covers a very realistic cybersecurity scenario. So we've got a traditional malware which is whiterabbit.obj. In some sense, it's deployed by an insider, but it is still a piece of malware that effectively takes down the systems of the entire business and leads to the complete demolishment of Jurassic Park. The dinosaurs get out, people die, bad things happen. That's the short version of it. One of the things that this movie did for me is it helped me connect cybersecurity with the real world. It helped me understand that the things that happen in the cyber world have very real consequences, and it's very important to set up those systems correctly. So we're going to talk about some of the concepts from Jurassic Park that have a relevance in modern cybersecurity. Traditionally, a lot of malware was delivered with the help of exploits, things being transferred onto the system. There would be some sort of website where people would go and accidentally click on stuff. It turns out you don't necessarily need to compromise the system directly if you can compromise the user. Now in Jurassic Park, what happens is there's this uh, character Dodgson who is from a competitor company to InGen. And what he's doing is he's basically bribing a disgruntled employee to access the security systems of Jurassic Park. Now this is the case of an insider threat, but it doesn't have to be that. There are other ways in which social engineering can work. So it doesn't have to be an employee who takes money from a foreign source and you know just works for them. It can also be someone just making a mistake or someone leaving their login credential somewhere they shouldn't. Someone falling for a scam or a phishing email that can easily become a case of social engineering. You might have seen these videos on YouTube. Sometimes you can even call services that you use. So let's say you've forgotten your password. How do you recover it? They ask you some questions. And once they have that information, they could just as easily hack into your account without actually doing anything technical. So. It's important to keep the data that is protecting your accounts private. Now, another folly with Jurassic Park was the over-reliance on automation. The movie was ahead of its time in more than one way, as I said. This is what we're seeing now. Our reliance on digital systems and automation is going up. Businesses are investing in automation, and that's understandable because automation is cheap. And it's also effective. It saves a lot of time. But over-reliance on automation also creates a massive security failure. So in this case, again, great example of things that probably shouldn't have been fully automated is the cars. So the cars in Jurassic Park, they ran on a track. So there was no secondary system that allowed you to drive the cars normally. They didn't have gas. If the system crashed, the car stopped. It's important to take notes from situations like this when you're building a business in the real world and try to think of how dependent you are on these digital systems and how are you working to protect them and also what alternatives are available to you if they go down. Now, another key concept is abstraction. So because of the over-reliance on automation, what we have now is abstraction. You may have heard of this concept in programming. It's actually good to abstract stuff, and, and that's fine. It makes things simple. But what it also does is it takes the decision makers away from ground reality. Now, in Jurassic Park, the way this played out is you had all these people who were running a theme park that had genetically engineered dinosaurs. But a lot of the people didn't even understand what the dinosaurs were, what would happen if a dinosaur got out. They were just dealing with their part of the job, and that's fine until the dinosaurs break out. <laughs> or you have to make a system where you're compromising the security of your park's fences. Now, I think if some of them were more aware of what dinosaurs are like or what raptors are like and what would happen if a raptor were to get out, I think they would have made some different choices. Another thing to keep in mind is points of failure. So Jurassic Park, it relied heavily on a single character element to take down the park, but a lot of systems do have a single point of failure. So sometimes all it takes is one crucial part of the system to go down for everything else to, to go down with it and to have basically a domino effect. And that's what happened with Jurassic Park. Now this is your traditional payload execution. So an insider threat runs a certain payload on the system. And the moment it's executed, all the fences go down in the park. Why did he do that? Well, we'll talk about that 
now. So there's another thing, which is the law of unintended consequences. Now, it's very common when we're doing business to think that every decision we take has only the consequences that we intend. A lot of actions will have unintended consequences, and this applies to cybersecurity as well. In this case, Dennis Nedry, he didn't want the dinosaurs to get out. He just wanted to steal some embryos. But in order to do that, he had to disable the security systems so he could get in. But as it turns out, if you can get in, the dinosaurs can get out. And that's what led to disaster in Jurassic Park. You can see all the factors coming into play here. First, you have the abstraction. So Dennis Nedry is so far removed from the reality of a T-Rex that he doesn't realize the danger he's putting himself and everyone in by taking down the security systems. Secondly, we have the single point of failure, and we also have the unintended consequences. He did not intend for this to happen, but it doesn't matter. It happened anyway. Now, what happened to the business in this case is John Hammond and the team at InGen, they were locked out of their own systems. If you're familiar with cybersecurity, this sort of thing happens all the time. So here you've got uh, this permission denied and you didn't say the magic word. If you think about it, this is very similar to a ransom note. Nowadays, you hear about threats like ransomware hitting businesses, holding everything for ransom, and they have a very similar note on the system. And if you want to get your data back, if you want to get your business back up and running, you have to pay them Bitcoin. Some companies will pay Bitcoin in the order of millions of dollars because they have no better option. And that's what fuels the ransomware industry and the threat actor industry these days. It's all financial incentive. Gone are the days when it was just uh, people trying to have fun or geeks trying to have fun. Nowadays, malware is just as professional or financially motivated as any business is. Now, another consequence of, of such a cybersecurity incident is often a data breach. These days, a lot of threats, when they compromise a business, they're not content to just destroy your systems or to render them unusable because they know that eventually you'll be able to get them back up and running again. Worst case scenario, you can replace the computers. That doesn't help them because they need to get paid. So what they do is they actually steal your data. Critical information relating to your business. Once it's stolen, you pretty much have no other choice but to pay the cyber criminals because that's the only way you can hope that they're not going to leak it. What he's doing here is he's stealing the dinosaur embryos. So these are things that InGen spent decades researching, and he's just going to sell it to a competitor, and that's going to destroy their business. Data breaches can often threaten the life of a business and something to really look out for. So that's management of data for you. Now, another thing that businesses are often plagued by in modern times is a complicated recovery procedure. Funnily enough, most of businesses I speak to, they actually have backups. They actually have a lot of security systems. They have a process, but it's almost as good as not having one because it's not going to work in the event of a real attack anyway. And that's what we had with Jurassic Park. So they tried to restart the system to get rid of the malware. You know, hard reset. That's fine. Except, in order to boot up the system, they had to boot up these individual components. And the only way to do that was to go to a maintenance compound that was at the other end of the... It was fairly far away. And that's where we had the scene of uh, Ellie Sattler being chased by the raptors. But basically, people had to risk their lives to, <laughs> to try to get the systems back up. Again, classic example of abstraction not helping people in charge didn't even know the risks that would be involved in restarting the system. Like they were like, okay, let's restart the system. But now you have to walk to the other end of the compound and there's raptors loose and they're probably going to eat you on the way. And this happens to a lot of businesses now where they have backups, they have a lot of security mechanisms, but once they're hit by ransomware, they realize, oh, wait a second, the backups are also controlled by the same systems that were hit by ransomware. So the ransomware just, the hackers had control of systems, they deleted all the backups as well. Or better yet, they have backups, but they have it in some really old format, tapes or drives that are so slow that it would take weeks or months to actually do the restore operation. The cost of just doing the backup or restoring from backup is actually way more than what the ransomware authors are charging. Cyber criminals get paid just because of simple business reasons. It's like it's just cheaper to pay them than to do it the right way. 
And so it's important to understand the recovery procedure for your business. So why do we have these problems? Why is cybersecurity so hard? Well, part of it is the detection problem. Now, fundamentally, cybersecurity is all about differentiating malicious access or use from legitimate access or use. Now, the problem with that is there's no such thing as a malware behavior. Great example is, well, encryption. Encryption, what is it? It's a security mechanism. So it's not like encryption itself is something that's malicious or, or bad, but it's the use of encryption to lock you out of your system that can be considered malicious. So any behavior that can be used by a user can also be used by an attacker. So you have to play this guessing game. You're trying to guess is this program trying to do this for malicious purposes? And you cannot have, by definition, all the information because you don't have the user interaction part. That depends on the user. So how do you know if the encryption program is running because the user ordered it, they use this tool to encrypt this data, or the attacker is using the tool? There's no way for a computer to make that decision. And so in order to detect malware, a lot of what we have to do is we have to take this complex thing. So that's the shape in the foreground that's changing. And we have to model it into static parameters. That's the shapes in the background. So we're taking this multi-dimensional object and we're mapping it into a two-dimensional, well, it's not two-dimensional, but into much fewer dimensions. And so there is that intrinsic loss of data. So no detection engine is ever going to be 100% perfect in the sense that it's going to block every malicious action and it's going to allow every legitimate action. Now, cybersecurity is based around these three concepts. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So let's say we're talking about integrity. That would be not having your data encrypted by ransomware or maintaining data integrity. You could easily do that if just nobody accesses the system. But then you affect availability because it's not available to you. So you're having the same effect as or a ransomware attack would because you, you can't access your own data. Many of you may have faced this when uh, you've been asked to set a complex password and you set a 24 character password and then you forgot it. Now you're locked out of your own account. You've secured yourself, but at what cost? So a, a good principle here is the principle of least privilege. As little as necessary to get what you need to get done done. So these are some of the cybersecurity problems. Well, what about cybersecurity products? The market for cybersecurity products currently is a minefield. Every cybersecurity product, be it EDR, XDR, firewall, whatever they call it, it has to do the same thing that we discussed earlier, which is the detection problem. It has to solve the detection problem. What makes a product a good product is whether or not they solve that problem well. So in terms of how many malware actions are they able to detect and how few false positives do they create while detecting them. And uh, there's a lot of products in the market that just claim to be outside of that space. Like they will say, well, we don't do blacklisting, we do whitelisting. Well, it just inverts the problem. So now you have to whitelist every file that's not malicious and you just block everything else. Doesn't mean you don't have the detection problem, you just have it the other way around. A lot of that is not tested. So let's say you want a detection-based solution like a traditional antivirus. There's years of test data on different companies that you could use to judge whether they're actually good detection engines or not. But if somebody tries something entirely different, you don't have any test data for it. So you don't know if they've done a good job of solving the problem or they've just done a pretty horrible job of solving the problem. So that's one of the major challenges when it comes to picking a cybersecurity product is to avoid all of the marketing noise and figure out fundamentally how is the product that you're using solving the detection problem? How well is it doing that and how do you compare that? That's, that's what motivates me to test all of these products. And I think this is an underrepresented part of the entire cybersecurity process. A big part of cybersecurity is testing. These days, testing is, is very much out of fashion. Many of you may be familiar that platforms like Windows, they don't, they don't do testing anymore. The game industry doesn't do testing anymore. They just rely on their users to do the testing. So they outsource the testing to the user. That's fine. If you're just a user, you can complain about it on the forums. But if you're a business and a mistake could be very costly, I think it makes sense to invest in testing and to make sure that the systems you have in place actually work. It's not uncommon for me to come across a business that I'm consulting with who have a very high cybersecurity spend. So they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on 
different cybersecurity solutions, but they're configured so poorly that they actually do worse than just getting a free antivirus for Windows. And you might think, how is that even possible? Well, here's a traditional example. So recently, I was consulting with firm and they had a very popular next-gen product, let's say. And this product, again, claimed to block all kinds of malware. But in order to do that, they would pretty much block every other application. When the company used this product, the employees constantly had issues using the programs they needed to use. And as a result, they had to change some of the policies within the program. They had to make it less aggressive so it wouldn't detect the stuff they was detecting. And what they didn't realize is by doing that, they made the product pretty much useless. This is not a good security solution. They kept making changes to their information security policies and they never tested what outcomes would result of that. Whatever you do, make sure you test it, make sure you emulate actual threat scenarios, like what's gonna practically happen if there's ransomware. It's easy to get caught up in the minefield and be lost in the complexity. Oh, I've got XDR++, so I'm very secure. It's like, no, somebody needs to go on the system and check. Now, I'm going to conclude here, but we will have time for questions. Now, also, if you want to engage with the PC Security Channel, feel free to check us out on YouTube. Just search for the PC Security Channel. Find me on Twitter at LeoTPSC. And you can also join us on Discord. So this would be a great platform for those of you who might be interested in learning more or engaging with the community, or you have some questions after this talk that you want to follow up on. Check out discord.tpsc.tech. And yeah, now I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to your questions.